Here, Dr. Stanger says, well, but why think that uh, nothing is the more natural state? I'm not claiming nothing is a more natural state. As he said, nothingness isn't a state at all. Nothingness is non-being. It is the absence of anything. And that's why there doesn't need to be an explanation for nothingness, because there isn't anything that requires an explanation. Nothing exists. But anything that exists has to have a reason why it exists, either in an external cause or in the necessity of its own nature. And I don't think Dr. Stenger's ever been able to refute that fundamental principle which underlies all of science. What it means is that there must be some sort of an entity beyond the universe, greater than the universe, which exists necessarily beyond space and time by a necessity of its own nature which explains the universe. And I also argue that this must be a personal being as well. Secondly, the argument from the beginning of the universe. In his uh, last rebuttal, Dr. Stenger says, well, particles begin to exist without causes. Two responses. First of all, that's simply not true. In quantum physics, the quantum vacuum which spawns these particles is not nothing. It is a sea of fluctuating energy having a rich physical structure, even though it is an indeterministic cause on certain interpretations of quantum physics. Secondly, there are many different interpretations of quantum physics, at least ten I can think of, and some of these are wholly deterministic. And therefore, uh, and, and by the way, nobody knows which of these ten interpretations is correct. And therefore, quantum physics does not furnish a successful counterexample to the principle that everything that comes into being has a cause. Now, Dr. Stinger also says, but uh, you don't need to believe in the Big Bang Theory. There could have been some pre-existing universe, a cyclic universe. But notice that he admits that you must have an equally plausible model. And the fact is that these cyclical models are not equally plausible with the standard Big Bang model. In 1994, Bord uh, and Vilenkin, two astrophysicists, showed that any eternally inflating universe must have a singularity in its past, an absolute beginning. And just last year, Alan Guth, in cooperation with Alexander Vilenkin, were able to extend these results to cyclical, ekpyrotic scenarios, such as Dr. Stenger suggested, also proving that they cannot be past eternal. And this is the repeated pattern of 20th century cosmology. Over and over again, attempts to avert the prediction of the Big Bang in the standard model, the absolute beginning, have been falsified over and over again. Uh, steady state theories, oscillating theories, inflationary theories, ekpyrotic scenarios, over and over again, the prediction of the standard model of an absolute beginning has been corroborated. And so I think that that is the plausible view. Certainly the evidence supports the premise that the universe came into being. According to uh, Stephen Hawking, and I quote, almost everyone today agrees that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Dr. Stinger says, well, there could have been a backward growing time prior to the Big Bang, but he didn't answer my arguments that showed that that was incoherent. And when you craft that diagram correctly with two perpendicular axes, it only makes it all the more clear that T equals zero does represent the absolute beginning of the universe. As for the argument from fine tuning, I think what we saw there was that the probability of the existence of life, as I defined it, is incomprehensibly small uh, 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 given the, the necessity of the fine-tuning of the universe. He says, but low probabilities happen all the time. That's a misunderstanding. The argument is not about the probability of this universe existing. It's the probability that any universe would exist, which is life-permitting. That probability is not like anybody's winning the lottery, where everybody is equally improbable. It's like a lottery where you have a billion, 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 billion black balls mixed together with one white ball, and you're asked to reach in and pull out a ball. And if it's, unless it's white, you'll be executed. Now, whichever ball you pick is equally improbable, right? But nevertheless, it is overwhelmingly more probable that whichever ball you pick, it will be a black ball. It will be life prohibiting. And it's in that sense that the fine-tuning of the universe is incomprehensibly improbable and cries out for an explanation. As for the moral argument, Dr. Stinger agrees there is no uh, evidence for objective morality. If you agree with me, however, that things like racism, the Holocaust, uh, rape, 
child abuse are really objectively wrong, then you will agree with me that God exists. And I simply rest my case on that deductive argument. As for the arguments concerning the evidence for the resurrection, Dr. Stinger merely said there's no evidence outside the Bible, but what I'm arguing is that when scholars weigh the biblical evidence, there is enough evidence right there. Treating them as ordinary historical documents will get you to, I believe, the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation. So what intellectual price do you have to pay to adopt Dr. Stinger's view tonight? Well, let me just list what you've got to believe in order to reject these arguments. You've got to believe that a contingently existing universe inexplicably exists for absolutely no reason at all. You've got to believe in a logically incoherent model of the origin of the universe, which no other scientist in the world accepts. You've got to believe, thirdly, that the conditions suitable for life are not narrowly constrained, despite all the evidence to the contrary, or else you've got to believe in an infinite number of randomly ordered parallel universes without any evidence for their existence whatsoever. Fourth, you've got to believe there's no moral difference between a mother who loves and nurtures her children and a sexual predator who preys upon them, that moral praise and blame are unjustifiable and purely subjective. Five, you've got to believe on the basis of your own authority that the majority of the world's historians who have studied the life of Jesus are mistaken about the historicity of the empty tomb, the appearances, the origin of the Christian way, or else embrace some naturalistic explanation which has been virtually universally rejected by contemporary scholars. And finally, number six, you've got to believe that everyone who claims to have a personal experience of God is deluded. You've got to believe all of this just to reject the six arguments I gave, and that still leaves you without any solid case for atheism. And that's why, personally, I believe the case for Christian theism is by far the more compelling. Dr. Stenger, your final statement. Now, Dr. Craig believes in the God of the gaps. That's the God who is used as a substitute explanation for something we don't understand until the time comes along that we do. Dr. Craig cannot see how the universe came about naturally, so it must have come about supernaturally. He cannot, cannot see how the universe became orderly by natural processes, so order must have come about by supernatural processes. He cannot see how objective morality can come from humanity, so it must have come from God. He cannot see how Jesus' tomb could have been empty, so it must, he must have risen from the dead. And finally, Dr. Cray cannot see how his inner experience of God could be a simple physical brain process so it must be a true experience of God. In each of these cases, we can give a plausible, natural explanation that violates no known principles of science and requires no divine action. Dr. Craig does not succeed in proving that these natural explanations are wrong. He's trying, he tries to argue that they're implausible, but in fact, everything I've talked about uh, is consistent with all the knowledge we have in science and is uh, in perfect agreement with uh, existing theoretical facts, experimental and theoretical facts. So I don't think Dr. Craig succeeds in proving that God exists. Even if the goal of the debate were not proof but simply arguing to the best explanation, Dr. Craig fails. Secular humanism or materialism is a better explanation than theism or supernaturalism. It's simpler, more consistent with empirical observations. In fact, Dr. Craig offers no explanations at all. It's not an explanation for the order of the universe to say God did it. How did God do it? Where did God come from? All these issues, all, all you do when you say that God did it is you push the explanation back one level. It doesn't explain a thing.